Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to, to, to give here, giving this talk to you. I'm from, I'm now at sunny Barcelona, but I spent quite a few years in London working at, uh, at Imperial College with uh, Professor Emil Lupu there. And actually today, most of the work that I'm, I'm going to present is the work that I did at the, at the Imperial College. I cannot show you yet the work I'm doing currently at Telefonica, but uh, the scope of the talk is uh, on this uh, topic that is gaining more and more importance nowadays about the security of machine learning systems, or as we most uh, know it as uh, adversarial machine learning. Oops. <clears throat> so first of all, I wanted to start with this picture of AlphaGo. This was back in 2016 that show the potential and the capabilities of uh, state-of-the-art machine learning offering superhuman performance. So in this case, we see Lee Dol, who was the world champions of uh, Go, this ancient uh, Chinese strategy game, and was consistently defeated by this uh, artificial intelligence developed by, by AlphaGo. However, at the same time, we started to see in, in the news concerns and, and cases where it seems that the application of artificial intelligence brings important risks. And uh, there are some stories to, of failure that needs to be considered. I also included the, the latest one from Google Gemini, uh, for those that you may not know. So, um, the, the image generator of uh, Google Gemini was a bit inaccurate. In So in order to provide uh, racially diverse uh, pictures, it, were, it, it met the mark and it was uh, offering pictures that are, were completely inaccurate, like a racially diverse Nazi soldier or uh, the problems with the founders of uh, of the the father founders of the the US you can find it in in the in the news and actually the the very same case that i i mentioned before about alphago it was shown that uh, alphago could be beaten by using very simple strategies that an advanced player of go would never would never use so <clears throat> We see that uh, although we start to see impressive achievements uh, from different AI models, still there are aspects that need to be thoroughly considered. And one of them is the security of machine learning systems. And uh, machine learning systems can be compromised as any other type of systems. So uh, we start to see proliferation and sophistication of these attacks and, and, threats, and threats. And often machine learning systems are one of the weakest parts in the security chain. chain. This is starting to, to, to change, but the start, I think that we are far from where, where we should be. So the, there is this research community on adversarial machine learning where we try to understand the, the threats and analyze and assess the, 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 the security of machine learning algorithms and systems, understanding the weaknesses, and proposing mechanisms to cope with these, uh, these threats and challenges that we have nowadays. So we can categorize basically the, the, the threats that we have in, in a machine learning system. Uh, I'm talking about uh, threats that affect the performance of, of the system. Not that I'm not talking today about the privacy, uh, privacy attacks. So with this regard, we can differentiate between evasion attacks, which are the attacks that happen at inference time. One, the, the, the model is deployed. The attacker aims to find the blind spots and the weaknesses to produce error on the, on the target model, so to evade detection. On the, others, the other hand, we have poisoning attacks that happen at training time, uh, where the attacker tries to compromise the data collection and subvert the learning process to produce some type of, uh, of error. This can enable backdoor attacks, as I will mention next. And the attacks can also be combined to uh, so that uh, a poisoning attack can be used to facilitate future evasion attacks. But let's start with, uh, with poisoning, poisoning attacks. Uh, this is uh, an example that I like to show about how poisoning 
can really damage uh, an entire uh, AI system. So this happened in 2017. This was Thai. It was a chatbot uh, deployed by Microsoft to, to chat with young people in Twitter. So the, the goal the goal for this chatbot was to learn from the interactions with young people and try to use the same kind of jargon that they were using. So it was trained to adapt to the uh, according to the the interaction that the that this chatbot was having, and these were the first post uh, the first tweets from Tai, and these were the type of post that Tai was tweeting uh, fifteen hours later. So basically, Tai became a racist monster and was doing very inappropriate comments. Uh, Microsoft was forced to, to shut down the, the system. What happened here is that there was a bunch of users that were interacting with Ty in a very bad way. And the chatbot didn't judge. So it just learned from the interactions and the, 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 for the chatbot, these type of comments seem like uh, appropriate. So obviously this, this had negative consequences for the reputation of a company like Microsoft. This is something that happened to Google Translator, for instance. So it was uh, it was manipulated with the feedback provided by a bunch of users, so that in the translations from English to to Chinese, uh, the sentence so sad to he to be to see Hong Kong become China, the translation that we see on the on the right for those who, uh, that can understand Chinese is just the opposite. It's saying that it's very it's very nice to see Hong Kong become China, and this just happened from a bunch of users providing bad feedback about the the translation that we, that Google was uh, was making. So, re with respect to the types of poisoning attacks, we can differentiate two two families of categories. First, uh, we have indiscriminate versus targeted attacks, and that uh, depends on the number of data points targeted by the attack. In indiscriminate attack, our aim is to produce errors on a large set of uh, of inputs or for a large set of predictions. Whereas for targeted attacks, we are just focusing on very specific uh, on very specific uh, instances or very specific use cases. Obviously, it's not a black or white. We can have something in the middle. For instance, uh, subpopulation poisoning attacks focusing on certain populations have already been proposed in the research literature. On the other hand, we can categorize the, 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 the depending to the error or on the error that the attacks want to produce, we can differentiate between error generic or error specific attacks. In error generic, the attacker just wants to produce an error regardless of the type of error that we want to produce. And in error specific attacks, the attacker is more uh, specific on, on the, 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 the misclassification, uh, for instance, in a classification problem, that the, that we want to produce, and in the in the picture we have an example of what a, an error and an error specific an error generic and an error specific attack look like. Um, finally, on the poisoning attack side, we have backdoors, and in backdoors, follow the same principle of backdoors and trojans as uh, we know in traditional system security. So for backdoors, the objective of the attacker is to, to produce an attack where the system behaves normally for regular data, but performs badly for a specific inputs chosen by the attacker. In the, the example with the pictures, imagine a traffic sign recognition uh, task with a machine learning model. We could inject a backdoor so that every time I put a sticker on a, onto a, a stop sign, the machine learning model will stop recognizing that as a stop sign and will recognize it as something else, for instance, a speed limit uh, sign. And that can have very negative consequences for the safety of, uh, of drivers using this, this type of systems for autonomous uh, driving, for instance. <laughs> With this background, I wanted to present first the, our work on optimal positioning attack strategies which is a way to model worst case scenarios uh, to evaluate the, the security of different machine learning models against poisoning attacks. The way of doing this is uh, through a formulation leveraging by level optimization, where we uh, put first 
the attacker objectives, which is typically to maximize some type of error evaluated on a validation or a target uh, or a target data set. AVAL would be the attacker objectives or the attacker cost, which typically is uh, is uh, trying to maximize the loss function on on that validation or or target data set. And the objective of the attacker uh, needs to be aware that the machine learning model uh, of the victim is adjusting its parameters, is learning its parameters by minimizing the, the problem that we have there. So it's trying to minimize some cost function or loss function, uh, evaluate it on a combination of uh, training or clean data, cl uh, sorry, clean training data points and the poisoning points injected by, by the adversary. So this dependency uh, creates this uh, bi-level optimization problem that I'm showing there. Uh, this, this formulation was already proposed in the research literature, and there is an uh, exact way of solving that, but the exact solution can only be applied to a very specific set of classifiers, mostly for linear classifiers. So we can compute it, the compute this exact solution by applying the Carus Cantacker conditions and implicit function theorem, and we have the expression that I'm that I'm showing there. However, uh, as I said before, this is limited to basically linear classifiers, and it has poor scalability with the number of parameters of the model. Even for uh, even for linear classifiers, if we have a lot of features. Computing this can be can be infeasible in in many cases, so we went beyond the the state of the art by uh, using approximate techniques to solve this relevant optimization problem. We were using back gradient or reverse mode differentiation. So the idea is the is the following: instead of solving at each uh, iteration, at each training epoch to solve this level optimization problem. Uh, we, with the traditional approach, we need to train the full model up to convergence. Then we apply the Carus Cantacker conditions, we compute the gradient, we do one update in the outer optimi optimization problem, but that is very expensive. What we do instead is just training the, the model for a few epochs at uh, its training round in this, in this process that I mentioned. And then, so we, we compute the gradient descent approach with the algorithm that I'm showing on the left, the one that everybody knows. And then from, from the, the latest point that we, we've got, from the latest parameters that we've got uh, in this truncated learning process, we go backwards by applying the algorithm that I'm showing on the right. So you will see that there are some vector uh, Hessian products there. So the good thing with the, the, this uh, vector Hessian products is that they can be computed in a very efficient way without the need of computing the Hessian, which makes the algorithm computationally much more efficient. And here you have some results on the MNIST dataset where we show the effect of two types of attacks, error generic and error specific attacks, where we try to misclassify digit eight as, uh, as three. In the error generic case, if we observe the, the, the test error per class, we, we see an increase on the error for, for all the digits. Whereas in the error specific attack, the error is uh, mostly focused on, uh, on, digit, um, on digit eight, which is the, the target class. For the error generic attack, if we look at the aggregate effect, we observe the, that the back reading optimization produce a significant increase on the error as we increase the fraction of, of poisoning points. So for instance, from a baseline of 0 0.12 approximately uh, <clears throat> error rate, we increase it uh, beyond 0 0.2 just by, by adding 5% of, of, uh, of, poisoning, of poisoning points. On the right hand side, you can see the effect on the on the confusion matrix. So for the error generic attack, the attack, the error is increased, the, the error increase is spreaded across the, the matrix, whereas for the error specific attack, the error is really focused on the, the target, which is uh, misclassifying digit eight as a as a three. 
<laughs> However, we observe a limitation on the standard formulation of these optimal questioning attacks. And is that hyper, uh, hyper parameters are often considered constant. And we observe that hyper parameters can play a significant role uh, and can also help to enhance the robustness of the model. And this is the case of, uh, of regularization. So in these two papers that I am showing there, <clears throat> We observe and, and show that uh, hyperparameters can change significantly if they are optimized in an appropriate way, depending on the on the strength of of the attack. So, in the picture, what we have is a case where we use no regularization, and the color maps indicates where are the regions where, by injecting a portion point, a portion in point, I can increase the test error and uh, comparing the non-regularization case with the regularization case we observe with the color maps that if we use regularization the increase of the error is very very moderate uh, and the, the the color of the of that map is mostly blue whereas for the case where no regularization is applied just by adding this single positioning point we can increase the error uh, a lot and the, the the picture on the on the right uh, shows what is the value of the regularization parameter that we would learn uh, depending on the position of the positioning point. So we observe that there are regions in the space where if we place the uh, positioning point, the regularization parameter that we would learn increases uh, a lot. And that helps to counteract the effect of this, uh, this attack. Basically, what we did is we extended the formulation of the bi-level optimization problem so that the outer objective now it's a minimum, uh, minimax problem. Uh, so on one side, we have the attacker that wants to maximize the error on a validation data set, and the defender is trying to minimize that error on the, sorry, to, to adjust the hyperparameters to minimize the error on that validation data set. This would correspond to a scenario where the defender of the victim is uh, has a small trusted data set available. So we are showing that if we have a small trusted data set available to set or to adjust the hyperparameters with uh, with regularization, we can significantly reduce the effect of, of the attack. In the picture, we're showing uh, <clears throat> different, different cases on the application of regularization. First, we have a case with uh, very small regularization. In this case, we took an arbitrary value of minus eight. Uh, we took uh, we considered the opposite, uh, an scenario with a lot of regularization. We the, the green line depicts the scenario considered by previous uh, optimal positioning attacks, where the hyperparameter is considered as a constant, and the orange line is the the, the solution that we get by solving the problem that I'm showing on the left. And as you can see, the optimal solution is the one that we are that we're, that we are offering with uh, with this formulation. So we observe that for a very small fraction of positioning points, the model with a lot of regularization performs significantly worse, but as we start increasing the the models, sorry, the models, the the fraction of positioning points, uh the models with Little regularization or the models that use this constant value for 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 the regularization parameters start to degrade the performance a lot, whereas the the, the approach that we propose uh, have a much more moderate increase on the on the error. So we really see a gap, and we really see a significant reduction on on the on the effect of poisoning. So on the other hand, the other limitation that we observe from the application of optimal positioning attacks as they are, is that in many cases, uh, these attacks can lead to positioning points that can be mitigated with outlier detection. So in this work that I did with Andrea Paudice, who, by the way, just joined your, your department recently or is about to join, uh, we show that the application of outlier, of, uh, outlier detection can help to completely mitigate these type of attacks in some scenarios. Obviously, we need to take into account for the cost of dimensionality, and there are 
complex data set where this uh, the application of outlier detection may be super suboptimal. But still, uh, for some applications, we believe that outlier detection uh, can can help a lot to mitigate these uh, sloppy poisoning attacks that just try to maximize the, 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 the error, but doesn't take into account any detectability constraint. And that leads to the next contribution that I wanted to, to show today with respect to poisoning, which is the use of generative adversarial nets to craft uh, poisoning attacks at a scale, but taking into account also detectability constraint. So one of the limitations that we observe with the optimal positioning attacks is that the solving by level optimization problems is complex and uh, it presents problems related to scalability. Even if we apply uh, reverse mode or back gradient optimization, as I showed before, for very large data sets, we, we still have problems to, to compute the positioning points. And the other aspect is the, the detectability that I, that I showed before. So we saw that we can bypass these limitations by using generative adversarial nets. So we propose this non-conventional uh, generative adversarial network that we call PIGAN, uh, where we have the generator who's playing this game uh, against the discriminator and the classifier that the attacker is trying to target. So the game for the attacker would be the following. I want a generator capable of generating poisoning points capable to deceive the classifier, to increase the error on the classifier, but at the same time, points that are difficult to detect by the discriminator. So this is the formulation that we have there. And uh, you observe that we have this, uh, these two competing objectives uh, for the generator with respect to the classifier and the discriminator. And uh, to solve the optimization problem, you, we use a scalarization and we have this parameter alpha that control how much importance we give to one or the other objective. So a higher value of alpha would mean that I'm focusing more on the discrimination, the discriminator objective. So I'm taking more seriously, not being detected rather than trying to maximize the impact of the attack and vice versa. For alpha equals zero, I don't care about detectability. I just go for damage. To illustrate the, 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 the effect of this uh, PIGAN with respect to this value of alpha, I'm showing this picture where we have a linear classifier. I'm not showing the decision boundaries because I'm more interested here in showing the, the, the cloud of points that we are generating. But we are aiming to classify the green points and the blue points. The red points depict the, um, the poisoning points injected by the attacker, the distribution of poisoning points injected by the attacker which should be labeled as green data points. So we are trying to inject uh, the malicious data points that are labeled as green. So for alpha equals zero means that we don't care at all about detectability constraints so that the region of the poisoning points is completely far away and completely disconnected from the region of green data points. So it, 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 we have access to some, to some trusted data set of, of uh, uh, we, can, we can really figure out we can easily figure out that we have a lot of outliers there. But as soon as we start increasing the value of alpha, we start to see that the poisoning points that we are crafting, especially for the case of 0.2, are poisoning points that are not far from genuine green data points that are trying to push the decision boundary towards the, towards the, the region of the, of the blue classes. As we increase the value of alpha, we are more conservative. So for alpha equals 0.8, the attack is very, very conservative. We are not pushing the decision boundary that much. And for alpha equal to one, we just have a standard gun. So we just look at the discriminator. We don't care about the, the attacker objective. Let me show you another, another example with the fashion MNIST data set. So in this case, we wanted to craft attack to uh, an attack to increase the error of, uh, of the Uncle Boots class by injecting uh, fake genuine sneakers. So on the left, we have the genuine sneakers. Uh, on the right, we have the genuine Uncle Boots. And on the center, we have the images generated by Pigan. And as you can see, the images uh, generated by Pigan can be seen as uh, high top sneakers or low top Uncle Boots. So, are kind of in the middle of the of the two classes, 
but still they look like a shoe they don't look like something completely different that can be easily filtered out with uh, with outlier detection and uh, our experimental evaluation against different different defensive mechanisms and robust uh, optimization techniques show that we are capable of bypassing bypassing these defenses obviously the impact of the attack is not as spectacular as in the case of an indiscriminate poisoning attack tested with no defenses but this is obvious but we we observe that uh, with these attacks we can still perform uh, quite a significant amount of of damage and on the other hand we see that this technique can be used to consistently poison and, and shift the decision boundary of classifiers that are trained uh, in an online fashion. So we can also perform uh, more targeted attacks or error-specific attacks. And the effect that we have here is similar to the, the, the one that we show earlier on for the, the, the error-specific attacks with the, with the optimal formulation. Okay, now let's change to the other type of attacks that uh, that uh, we know that there exist in the in the research literature. So possibly a lot of you have already seen this picture many 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 times. So it's this famous picture from the the paper from Goodfellow showing this panda image from the from a panda where we add a small perturbation noise depicted in the center. And with the, the 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 resulting picture in the right uh, is not classified as a panda anymore, but is classified as a gibbon, and a gibbon looks like uh, like this. So this this uh, these two papers started um, <clears throat> a lot of uh, research in this uh, in this area, and there there were many many concerns about the how brittle. Uh, deep learning models could be against these adversarial examples. And far from being a theoretical threat, we see that this type of attacks can really have an impact on the security and safety of uh, many systems. For instance, some hackers from a Chinese company showed that it was possible to deceive a, a Tesla to drive into the oncoming traffic lane by placing small white stickers on the on the road or uh, on the security side we start to see that uh, cyber criminals uh, use also ai and machine learning as a weapon to try to evade detection so we start to see malware that is trying to evade detection but the machine learning components uh, <clears throat> used by some some av engines and actually now in the area of chat GPT, one of the threats that we start to see is that chat GPT seems to be able to create mutating malware capable of evading, evading detection. So in the research literature, we can see different approaches for computing this uh, type of adversarial examples. Uh, I'm citing some, some of the original papers there. So we can think of minimum distance attack, attacks strategy, like the paper by Carlini and Wagner. So we try to, to go uh, to, to compute the perturbation closest to the decision boundary or go a little bit beyond to gain some more confidence. We can think of attacks with budget constraints. These budget constraints are typically modeled in the form of an LP norm, so L0, L1, L2 norm are typically considered here. So the idea is that the adversarial example then doesn't look very different to the original one. And there are uh, good approximations to, to compute attacks like the fast gradient sign method, which actually was perhaps the first uh, computationally more, most efficient method proposed to, to, to generate adversarial examples. However, when we were looking at this problem, um, we weren't sure about the lessons that we were learning by looking at this adversarial perturbation. So if you look at the noise pattern from the picture from the panda, there's nothing really there that tells me what's going on. And then we came across this paper from Musabi and Rizfuli uh, called Universal Adversarial Perturbations. Uh, the, these universal adversarial perturbations are noise patterns that when added to a large set of inputs, it produces errors 
for a large fraction of those inputs. So in other words, they are adversarial perturbations that generalize across inputs. And if you, you observe these patterns, they have a structure. They are telling us about uh, they are telling us something about the systemic risk of these machine learning models. So inspired by this work, we started to investigate adversarial examples with procedural noise patterns. So for us, it was, okay, can we generate noise patterns a model with a small set of parameters that can enable black box attacks? And the answer was yes. So procedural noise functions are <clears throat> noise patterns that are typically used in, in computer graphics applications and uh, they can be used for generating textures, for instance. And we used two families of, uh, of procedural noise functions. One was Perlin noise and the other one was Gabor noise. And we use a very reduced set of parameters to model them. I think in the two cases, it was three, uh, three parameters for Gabor noise and four parameters for, for Perlin noise. And we were considering um, grayscale patterns. So even if we were using uh, color image, we were adding the same <clears throat> the same amount of noise to each one of the channels. We we tried with uh, with more complex patterns, what, but we didn't see a significant gain. So we we, we wanted to keep it simple. Question? So, yeah. Uh, so is Perlin noise and Gabor noise like defined as a distribution? Like how is it defined? That's a good point, and that leads to <laughs> to my next slide. So they can generate different distributions of uh, of noise, and the, depending on the the type of parameters, you you can see different different patterns. So the first experiment that we did is like, okay, let's see how distribution the uh, the distribution of uh, a random distribution of uh, Perlin and Gabor noise can help to evade machine learning models. So. And we compare that with the case where we add just random noise to the to the classifier. We were comparing different models, BGG, ResNet, Inception, and Inception ResNet uh, V2. And what we observe is that even if we just add, uh, random uh, random perturbations, the evasion rate uh, that we achieve is significantly high without any optimization. So for instance, for BGG19, we can observe that the mean, so the, the, the an average perturbation can uh, evade like 70% of the samples. So if I add that random perturbation, 70% of the samples will be misclassified. And we observe a significant uh, improvement with respect to the median uh, to the, the the value of the random that we were obtaining for the random noise. Actually, the random noise had a very, very uh, small variance. So that's why we just depicted the, the, the median value for the random noise distribution. But we observed that just a random, uh, by randomly picking uh, this, uh, this Gabor noise uh, samples or Perlin noise samples, we were capable of evading that with quite a high confidence. So then the next step is like, okay, how can we optimize these parameters in order to achieve a higher success rate? So first we did it on an input by input basis. So we created like the standard, uh, the standard uh, uh, input specific adversarial example, but we did it in a black box way. And since we have a very reduced number of parameters, we could do that efficiently by using uh, Bayesian optimization. And uh, what we show in the picture is that uh, with an average number of queries of uh, seven, we can achieve a success rate close to 92%. And increasing the, 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 the query limit a lot doesn't help uh, that much. So we can learn, learn it quickly and, and evade the, the classifier within a, a few epochs. And we compare with the state-of-the-art attack by, uh, by that time, which was this bandit attack. And as we can observe, the for, for a reduced number of queries, our success rate was much higher. Uh, for, for larger numbers of queries, like 10,000 queries, uh, the attack from bandits was slightly better. 
but 10, 000, uh, doing 10,000 queries is, uh, is a lot. It's computationally too expensive compared to the seven uh, number of queries on average that we were that we were using. Then the second point was, okay, uh, from the first experiment, we show that even random perturbations can generalize quite well. Can we optimize on that? So again, we were using Bayesian optimization to optimize the perturbations to generate universal adversarial perturbations. And uh, the results were, were pretty, pretty good. So here we are comparing an inception V3 and we were performing these uh, black box attacks to, to craft the attack. We have, we assume that the attacker has a small uh, training set to optimize the, the perturbations. So depending on the training set, the accuracy uh, of the attack is, or the attack success rate is slightly different, but still we observe that even with a small number of, uh, very small number of training points, like 50, we are capable of achieving a high uh, evasion success rate of uh, more than 70%. Obviously we see a difference between the, the attack success rate evaluated on the training and the validation data set. And as you can imagine, there's a bit of overfitting if the number of training points is too, too small, but still, the the evasion rate is quite uh, is quite significant, and again the important thing here is that the effort for the attacker is is little because we just need to adjust these three four parameters. The other lesson that we learn here is that the attack generalizes across different applications in computer vision, so not only image classification but only object detection and semantic segmentation are very brittle against uh, against this type of of attack. So when analyzing the, the, the benefits of these attacks, we realized that um, this attack was uh, what we uh, was capable of fooling uh, many inputs at the same time. So it was uh, it was capable of creating successful universal adversarial perturbations, and it could be used across different models. So it could fool many many models. So it really poses a, a very relevant threat against computer vision, uh, computer vision data sets. And my, the final piece of work that I want to present today is also on the scope of universal adversarial perturbations, but in this case, in the scope of malware. So we, we have already seen the potential of universal adversarial perturbation and how they try to exploit a systemic vulnerability of, uh, of these models. But in the case of uh, malware detection, the exploitation of, uh, of universal adversarial perturbation can bring significant benefits for the attacker as uh, they reduce the effort uh, to craft successful attacks capable of evading detection and can be a promising approach for the malware as a service, let's call it business, uh, business model. So the first uh, analysis that we did was in the feature space. So we compared linear classifiers that are often used or are often, we often see in the research literature and deep neural network classifiers and compared the effectiveness of input specific and uh, universal adversarial perturbation attacks. And the, the, the results were surprising. For instance, for the linear classifiers, we observed that the performance of an input specific and a UAP attack is basically the same. Is the um, the blue and the red line depicted in the in the plot? Here we're measuring the the amount of perturbation with the L0 norm because the features that we have in these data sets are binary. So it's either that feature is present or not for for the piece of software of software analyzed. And in the case of the DNNs. We observed that, yeah, input specific are a, li a little bit better, but when we perturb up to 20 features, which in practice is very, very little, the effectiveness of both attacks is very, very, very similar. And again, 20 features is nothing for this type of, uh, of data sets. And the, the success rate that we can achieve with UAPs is very close to, to 100%. So we saw that uh, UAPs uh, are really a way to go 
to evade the uh, malware classifiers because you don't need to optimize on a sample per sample basis. You, you just can use the per same perturbation again and again and again and again. And you know that with a very high probability, uh, very close to one in this case, we can, we can evade the detection. However, the reality in the malware space is that this feature analysis doesn't represent uh, the set or is not representative of the capabilities of the attacker to craft the attacks. So in other words, the attacker that cannot manipulate directly the features used by the machine learning classifier, but it has to, the, the attacker has to manipulate the software in the problems, in what we call the problem space. I, re I really recommend the, the paper that I'm citing here, Intriguing Properties of Adversarial Machine Learning Attacks on the Problem Space, with, with my colleagues that uh, did this paper with me, where they, they really show the importance of modeling the problems in the, the, um, the attacks in the problem space, because they may differ significantly from the attacks that we can depict or we can imagine in the in the feature space. The problem is that the mapping between the problem and the feature space is non-invertible. So techniques re relying on gradients, computation of gradients, or are not are not really applicable here. So <laughs> following this methodology proposed in the paper that I saw before, we crafted universal adversarial uh, examples in the problem space, both for Android and Windows portable executable malware. So for Drevin and Ember datasets, which are quite considered in the, in the research literature. For Android, we have a search of chains. Uh, so we have pieces of, uh, of code that could be implanted into, into the malware. We have gadgets that could be implanted into the, the malware, and that's a methodology for, for doing that. And we had a pool of almost 4, uh, 1,400 gadgets. Uh, then we were performing a greedy search uh, and started to add gadgets that were capable of increasing the likelihood of, uh, of evading the, the systems. And finally, we were transplanting those gadgets to the target malware. In the case of the portable executables for, for Windows, we had a limited set of transformations because they were portable executables. So we didn't have access to the short code, but we still could do some transformations uh, leading to, to, functional, to functional malware. But it was more complicated than in the case of Android where we could modify the code. Uh, this is an interesting result that we got from for uh, Android. Uh, similar as, as in the case of, of the, the Perlin noise, uh, what we did is like, okay, let's see what happens if we add one gadget, what is the evasion rate that we can, that we can achieve? We observe that many of these gadgets, if we add them uh, in solitary, they have a very, very reduced impact, so most of them, but there is a few of them and actually more than 50 that have a universal elevation rate of more than 90%. And there is another 50 with a universal elevation rate between 80 and 90 and, and so forth. So just by adding a single gadget, 90% of the malware is, uh, will, be, will be evaded. And on the picture of the right, what we did is was we were uh, concatenating uh, randomly uh, some of these uh, some of these gadgets and observe the universal evasion rate just by, by doing it randomly, not with the greedy strategy. And what we observe is that just by adding ten gadgets at random, we can achieve a universal elevation rate very close to to one hundred percent. I hear I think that here it was yeah it was it was ninety eight something something like that. So again, even if the attacker doesn't have powerful optimization tools, just by chaining this, this transformation can really produce functional malware capable of evading detection. So uh, in order to mitigate this, uh, this threat, 
what we proposed was using adversarial examples in the adversarial training in the problem space. So adversarial training is perhaps the most promising approach to defend against uh, against adversarial examples. And we can do that also with universal adversarial perturbations. There are works on universal adversarial training. However, uh, the threats that uh, can be possible in the problem space, as I said before, may be quite different from the threats that we have in the or we find in the in the feature space. So if we perform adversarial training in the feature space using the standard techniques, maybe we are not covering the, um, the gaps or the blind spots that are really relevant to mitigate the vulnerabilities in the in the problem in the problem space. In the context of malware, we also need to take into account that we just want to protect the, the model in one direction. So we expect attacks where the attacker aims to generate malware that is not detected as malware, not the other way, not the other way around. So that can be taken into account to generate the adversarial example. So what we did in this case was as uh, generating the adversarial examples in the problem space can be computationally more or is computationally more demanding. We first pre-train the model on the regular inputs. So it's a pretty standard thing. Then we perform adversarial training for a reduced number of iterations. And at each iteration, what we do is the following. First, we find the UAP transformation change in the problem space with this greedy approach over the malware samples in the mini batch that maximizes the universal elevation rate. Then we apply the, that UAP only to 50% of the malware in the mini batch. And then we update the, the model with, uh, with gradient descent. The reason we, why we apply uh, the perturbation just to 50% of the malware is that we observe that if we use adversarial training in a classical setting where all the malware samples are adversarial, we are very good at uh, detecting adversarial examples, but we are not good to detect regular malware anymore. So it can have a, a negative effect. And here are some, some, some results to, to show the benefits of, of our approach. Uh, first of all, on the, the top, we, we show for driving, which is the Android case, the results on, on an undefended model uh, with a linear classifier, which is the typical case considered with driving and with a deep neural, deep neural network. And we can observe the universal elevation rate for uh, perturbations where we have one gadget, four gadgets, and ten and ten gadgets, and we observe that uh, for um, uh, for change with ten gadgets for the linear classifier, we can evade it with a hundred percent success rate, and in the case of the DNN, the the success rate is uh, ninety nine point five. Then. We compare feature space defenses versus problem space defenses, and we analyze uh, different strategies, uh, looking at the in the feature space at uh, the strength of the attack considered uh, with respect to the L0 norm. It was 20 and 40, and then two strategies. One is pure adversarial training, where all the malware samples during training are adversarial and a mixed strategy that is like the one that I depicted before. So it's like 50% of the malware is adversarial and 50% of the malware during training is regular. So what we what we observe is that, okay, for uh, we can reduce the, 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 the success rate of the attack for, uh, for the weakest attack with just one, one uh, gadget. But as we start increasing the the amount of gadgets, the defense is not really is not really useful. And if we compare with the problem space where we did uh, where we use uh, different number of iterations for doing this process, just one one epoch, three epochs, and five epochs of adversarial training, what we observe is that we are quite capable of uh, of mitigating uh, mitigating this uh, this threat, even against adaptive attacks that are aware of uh, of our the of our defense. Uh, on the the bottom lines, we have an example with LightGBM for Ember dataset, 
And in that case, we also show that adversarial training or using adversarial examples for training the light GBM, in this case, you need to, to grab them beforehand, before the training, uh, was a good solution for, for solving these problems. So that's all the, the work that I wanted to show and just as a summary, so I hope that the, you can understand now better how machine learning systems can be vulnerable to, to different attacks affecting the whole life cycle of, of the machine learning model. Here we've been looking at attacks that affect the performance uh, both during training at inference time and defending against these vulnerabilities is, is challenging. So um, I would say that first we need to improve the, our risk assessment tools and perhaps account for more realistic threats and unrealizable attacks. As in the case I was showing with the universal adversarial perturbations for malware. And the second aspect is to look at the whole system pipeline to analyze what are the weakest part and what is the, 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 the items that we really need in order to mitigate effectively these, these, threat, these threats. And still defending is a, 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 an open research problem because we consistently see that many of the defenses proposed by, in the research literature are often bypassed by, by adaptive uh, attacks. And uh, I haven't talked about the, about this, but uh, in the area of chat GPT, foundation models, large language models, uh, this problem becomes more relevant. And what we see is that the threat model for, uh, for these foundation models, LLMs, it can be quite different compared to more traditional, traditional models. And we need to consider the attacks at different stages. So it's not the same, the, 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 the attacks that we have to consider when training these models from scratch, like big companies do, or the, the, the process of adaptation or fine tuning that we can do with the smaller data sets. We also should be aware of the effects, of the cascading effects that these attacks have when we are composing uh, some of these, uh, of these models. And of course, the attacks at inference times are, are at inference time are a big challenge because of the complexity and the versatility of these models. And as you are possibly aware of, there are new attacks appearing targeting specific aspects of, of uh, LLMs like prompt injection attacks. And I guess that this is gonna be a very relevant area of research for the following years, especially with the regulations in place and the oncoming regulations like GDPR, uh, European AI Act. So I think that it would require to dig deeper into how to assess the vulnerabilities of these models and how we can certify or audit and monitor better these uh, machine learning models for having more trustworthy ML. So, I guess that is all on my side. Here you have my my contact uh, details. Uh, apart from that, uh, I would like to say that uh, Telefonica Research, we are a research department that uh, participates in a lot of new projects. So if you are interested in working with us, let us uh, let us know. There's a possibility of of collaborating with us through through European projects like uh, Horizons like uh, like uh, horizon proposals uh, we also support visiting researchers and from time to time we also have open open temporary positions for research internships so if you have uh, any idea or you're interested just drop me an, an email and, and we can talk thank you very much now i'm more than happy to take any questions <laughs>